body, but she always comes to us as a friend. <laughs> I've known her for many years since back when she lived in St. Paul. She's a member of the Sukanadu or Brule Sioux tribe, is a descendant of Peace, Peace Chief Iron Shell, and she's devoted her life celebrating her people's history, tradition, and teaching about the culture of that proud nation. She served on the Nebraska Indian Commission, she was named Outstanding Nebraska Indian Woman in 1985, and has been on the board and planning committee of the Lincoln Indian Center. She teaches Lakota traditional arts and is truly a treasure, an asset for our state, and I can't express how happy I am to have her with us here today. It's my great pleasure and honor to welcome back to Dan Broad, Phyllis Stone. I don't yell, I just talk loud. <laughs> so I probably won't use this microphone either because I tend to talk with my hands and it's really crazy, you know, holding a microphone and trying to do stuff it's like that. So it'll just be there until I really need it. My name is Phyllis Stone. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska now, but my real name is Wambli Galui. I am Sichangu Lakota, and my name means woman fanned by an eagle, and that's how she gets her strength. I love that name. Keeps me going when I remember my name every day. Keeps me going. I want to greet you in my language because our language is so very um, uh, particular, so very special. Chante wa shteyanapi chuzapi. One thing about the Lakota people, and probably most Indian tribes, is that we thank Tunkashila, that is our word, for the Creator, for God. We thank Him continually, all day long, every day. When the invaders first came here, and they saw us saying thank you to every living being continually, they thought we were worshiping everything. So they thought we had all these different gods. Not so. We have one God. We have Tungashila. Same God that you have. We just call him by different names. Oh, cool. Yay, Jeanette. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, oh, how could I stay away? <laughs> <laughs> ah, this is my best buddy that I had in St. Paul when I was living there, when I was growing my kids. Oh my goodness. One thing that I really remember about Jeanette, she called me one day in the middle of the afternoon, late afternoon, can you go over to my house and close my windows? I said, no. She said, well, it's raining. I said, I know. That's why I'm not going over to your house. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I'm so happy to see you. It's so cool coming back here. It's crazy. You know, Danabrog, St. Paul is only like two hours from Lincoln. But, you know, you don't get away. You just don't get away. I don't drive that much anymore, and uh, I have to rely on my granddaughter, who drives like crazy everywhere. <laughs> but uh, she's my driver, and she takes me most places that I have to be. And Carla is very good, my friend Carla from Lincoln. She's very good about taking me where I have to go, too. But today, I'm going to try to talk to you about the Lakota women primarily because I'm very proud to be a Lakota we. Very proud to be a Lakota we, Lakota woman. Uh, one time, when I was working somewhere at Workforce in Lincoln, this woman heard me quoting something from the Bible, and she said, you know the Bible. You know the Bible very well, and I said, uh, yeah, I went to mission school, 
and I had to learn the Bible from the nuns and priests. Yeah, I know it very well, and I continue to say that I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> you know, um, like any addiction, it takes you a long time to recover from something, so I still <laughs> practice some things that the Catholics do. I'm very grateful for my grandma, Iron Shell, who did, who raised me, who made sure that I got things done, and she's the one that insisted that I be baptized. And this friend was telling me, you know, the Bible, you should talk more about the Bible, and I said, why? Because you know it so well. You should be ashamed of yourself if you don't talk about the Bible to people. And I said, you know, your Bible was not written for me. I'm a Lakota we. That Bible was written for a European white man. And I don't go by everything in the Bible because that's not me. Oh, she still could not understand that. Could not understand. Probably still to this day she doesn't understand that. Doesn't mean that there are not some good things in that book. Doesn't mean that. Just that I don't go by it. One of my teachers, when I was getting my degree at Sinti Gleska University on the Rosebud Reservation, in one of his classes he said, you know, that Jesus guy probably would be a really good Lakota man. <laughs> and we all agreed, yeah, probably he would be. But uh, that is the reason why I chose to have one of my topics as the Lakota women. Because when the invaders came, they tended to not pay attention to the Indian women. Uh, they thought we were the way the women in Europe were, you know, chattel, possessions. Didn't realize that the Indian people, the Lakota people, were very equal people. And we, the women, had our jobs. And the men had their jobs. Very equal just as hard for man or woman. And we didn't walk behind the man, we walked alongside of him. And we carried as much as he carried. We defended as well as he did. We, when one of our family got hurt in one of our wars, we would go in there and get him back so that the enemy didn't get him. The women did a lot. The Lakota women did a lot. One of our phrases that is just said all the time, all the time, we will not be defeated until the hearts of our women are on the ground. We are a conquered people. We are an assimilated people. That just means that we have to live under somebody else's government. We have to know those rules and regulations. But if we want to be who we are, we also know and live by our ways. So when they talk about dumb Indian people, don't know this, don't know that, I'm sorry, you don't know what we know. We know an awful lot, and that is almost any Indian person. There isn't any minority in the United States who is taken care of, quote unquote, classified by the government except the American Indian people. They have a quantum system for us. They go by our blood amount. 
only people who have to know how much Indian blood we have. So when my children were growing, they grew up in St. Paul. They grew up among uh, non-Indian people. But they knew, they knew how much Indian blood they had. They knew how much Indian blood they had from me. They knew how much Indian blood they had from their father, who was a full-blood Navajo. They were half Navajo, and half of my Lakota, and then half of my French. My daughter, when she was just a little girl, just a little girl, we were in Denver one time. And this man in the shop made a comment about, oh, such a pretty little girl. And she said, I'm a Navajo. I'm a Navajo. But my daddy is a Caucasian. He's from the Caucasian tribe. Because <laughs> <laughs> my ex-husband, Ed Stone, everybody knew Ed Stone. He told everybody all the time that he was from the Caucasian tribe. That was okay. That was okay. In Lincoln, every year in um, uh, November, during the Indian History Month, the Indian Commission tries to put on a reading at one of the libraries. And they will have Indian people reading excerpts from different books. And we will get up and say our name and say our tribe. And one year, there were several of us and Jack Starita. You know Jack Starita? He wrote a book called The Dull Knives. Um, he's, he's a wonderful person. I served with him on the Mari Sando Society Board. And he was going to read something. And he got up there after some of us had said who we were and what tribe. He said, I'm, I'm sorry, Joe. I'm Joe Starita, and I'm from the journalism tribe. Because <laughs> he was teaching in the journalism department at the university then. When, when we have little ones, little girls, we tend to dress them the way we dress. I used to be a powwow dancer. I was a traditional dancer, and one of my dresses was a dress like this, a very traditional dress. And when my baby daughter, my granddaughter, was this little, can you imagine somebody being this little? When my granddaughter was this little, we made a dress for her, just like mine. And we did moccasins for her, just like mine. But the Indian women had a lot to say about their children and about their husbands and about the way they would go. Because the men didn't just act on the spot and say, we're going to do this. They would first confer with the women and then the women would make them see this point and that point, and then they would decide how they were going to go. And then they would have a council with the other elder men. And the men kind of would remember everything that the women had said, and that would help them make their decisions as to whether or not they were going to go to war against an enemy, or where they were going to hunt, or who was going to get quote unquote, yelled at in the camp. It was up to the woman. My tribe is a matriarchal tribe, which means that we do our lineage, our descent, on our mother's side primarily. There are some tribes, like the Omaha, uh, they go according to the uh, paternal, to the father. And sometimes, children that are born of some fathers, the fathers don't take time 
to make sure that those children know. Women are the caregivers. We are the nurturers. We decide how these little kids are going to dress, you know? And we continually tell our young how they're going to go in life. I mean, in St. Paul, when I was growing my kids, they had chores. All kids need to have chores, right? They had chores. And I made sure that I did their chore right along with them. I mean, you don't tell somebody to do something if you haven't done it. So I would go right alongside them and do things. John's chore was to take the dishes out of the dishwasher and load the dishwasher at night. Donna's chore was to take the clothes out of the dryer, put the clothes away. Tom's chore was to take care of the outside. And every time I did something all day long, I made sure that I was telling them about us, about our life, not just how we lived in St. Paul, no, how the Indian people lived a long time ago, how I lived when I was growing up, and how they should live their lives as Lakota people. As everybody knows, as any parent knows, you don't just continually go on and on and on at your kids. They won't listen to you. They won't listen to you. But if you do those things, even a reprimand, if you do those things in a story type of way, they will listen to it. And they will somehow think that it's their idea, which is cool. I am so very happy that I raised my kids like that. I probably learned that from my grandma when she was doing that to me. I am a product of my grandma, Iron Shell. My, my parents were good parents. They had jobs, they made good money, uh, but they were kind of dysfunctional. And my Grandma Ironshell was the one who guided me and made sure that I was going to do things the Lakota way. I say my grandma did that. Sometimes her words came out of my grandpa's mouth. My grandpa taught me a lot, but I know he taught me what my grandma wanted me to learn. I used to always think that it was grandma that came and packed up my things at the end of the school year and got us back to Hastings. It was my grandpa, my grandpa Iron Shell, who insisted that they had to be right there to get me to go back to Hastings on the same day that I got out of school. One day he said, you know Takoja, Takoja's grandchild, you know Takoja, I don't have to do what your mom says, because my mom was telling me all the time, telling my relatives, my friends, don't speak to Phyllis and Lakota. Don't tell Phyllis why we wear the clothes that we wear. Don't tell Phyllis about our ceremonies. And Grandpa just got tired of it one day and said, I don't have to listen to your mom. I don't have to listen to her. Come on, Takosha. We'll pray the way we pray. So we would go out, the golf course in Hastings, and Grandpa would have his pipe, and he would have his fan. And he would be praying as we were walking along. He'd be praying and singing and sending everything up to Tunkashila. I had no idea sometimes at first what he was saying, but I learned. And soon I was saying the same things. I was praying and I was singing and I was putting my arms up. I hadn't yet earned a fan or feathers, but I would put my arms up we did that for many years when I was growing. And one time, some time ago, I was speaking someplace, and uh, 
I'm, I'm saying those words. And I thought, well, maybe that didn't really happen to me. Maybe I read that someplace. And then this woman came up to, to me afterward, and she said, Phyllis, I remember you. I lived in Hastings when you were a little girl, and I used to see you and your grandpa walking out on the golf course, and I used to wonder what you were doing. I said, we were praying, and we were singing, and she said, no, I know. She said, I always wanted to be out there with you. I always wanted to do what you were doing. And I said, you totally validated me. You totally validated what I was remembering, because I was beginning to doubt myself that that didn't really happen to me. So thank you. I have a shawl here, so I can put it on and tell you about my old grandma. I have some books there. In one, you'll see a picture of my old grandma. Old grandma, grandma. She was older than my regular grandmas, and she was my first teacher. Old grandma would come to the house. She was a little old Indian woman. Didn't speak English, and she would come to the house with a shawl on, a black shawl. She always wore a black shawl with black fringes, not red fringes. And she would always say, Mama Dokiahe, Daddy Dokiahe, you know, where's your mom? Where's your dad? And so I would answer her in life. I would tell her where they were. I had to learn how to speak Lakota. You know, she wouldn't speak English. She, she just wouldn't. She taught me how to pick the best cherries, how to pick the best plums, buffalo berries, sand cherries. Old Grandma knew where all these things grew. That was really cool, because Old Grandma was blind. But she knew all these places, and she could smell all these places. And she taught me how to do that. Like I said, that was really cool. And I learned how to make the different dishes that we had, that they had a long time ago. One of them, I'm thinking is wasna, but that's not what the warriors carried. They didn't carry wasna. They carried, and I can't think the word of it, that it was made into patties. They ground the cherries and the um, plums. They made them into patties. Now it's really cool when we make them at home, all we do is put them on screens, you know, and shake them and shake them, and then they dry out. But not a long time ago, mm -mm. I had to climb up onto something high, you know, and lay them out flat and sit up there and shoo all these flies away. But I learned that from my old grandma. And old grandma taught me how to bead. She had sacks of beads around her little pellet. They, she didn't have a bed. Indian people didn't believe in beds. They really didn't like having the government come and tell them that they had to live in houses. What do they call them? Deadwood lodges. That they had to live in houses, and they had to sit on furniture, and they had to go to bed in a bed. They liked sitting on the ground. They liked sleeping on the ground because we believed, we still believe, that is where our power comes from, Unchimaka, from Mother Earth. That's where we get our energy. And by sitting on chairs and sleeping in beds, we were not getting the energy from Unchi that we needed to have. So old grandma had her pellet, her, her bed, on the floor. She had all these different bags of beads. And she knew where each color was. And she would tell me to start this and start that, you know, and she, <laughs> I, I would have to sometimes uh, thread a needle for her, but not always. She's such a cool old lady.
I mean, we are traditional people. And if we choose to live this traditional life, then we need to make sure that it's as close as possible and not the easy way. Very excited about that. Very excited about that. I mean, she summoned in while we're telling me what to do. <laughs> kind of in trance saying <laughs> no. Like I was explaining to Roger earlier, he asked me what clan I am. Lakota don't have clans. The Lakota have bands. I am Si Changu clan band. That means the um, red Thai people, the Bui people. We got our name because a long time ago, the enemy, probably the Pawnee, <laughs> the enemy set fire to the uh, grass close to our village. They were trying to burn us out. And the only way that we could save ourselves was to go through the fire and get on the other side. So those of us who had the strength to do it, ran back through that fire. And we got burned, of course. <coughs> Our legs especially got burned. And when people would see us after that, and they would see our burn marks, because the men, of course, you know, wore hardly any clothes, and they would see the burn marks on their legs, we started to become known as the burnt fly people, the si Changu people. I was telling a similar thing to an audience somewhere. And this man back behind, a white man, said, no, that's not how you got your name. <laughs> I said, oh, uh, how, how did we get our name? He said, well, the, the man rode horses all the time, and they didn't wear very many clothes, just the breech cloth and their legs got sunburned. That's why you were called the burnt thigh people. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but just noting to myself, you know. <laughs> One time, not very long ago, a couple three years ago, we were having a festival in one of the fire halls in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And I was making wojapi. That's one of our dishes. And these two guys were going to be wrapping and doing things for the kids. And one of them came in and said, mm, what is that smell? Oh, that smells so good. What are you cooking? And I told him, wojapi. And he said, what is that? And I told him that it was a, a fruit pudding. And that I said, I'm I'm a Phil Stone, I'm I'm Si Changu Lakota, and you are. And he said his name, and he said, Sidi Honey. And I said, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, it can't be the skinny honey. Oh, how awful. <laughs> and I said, No, you can't have any of my Wojapi. <laughs> and then I said, No, no, no. And I gave him some. And I said, do you know what you people used to do to us? He said, I know. I know, but I'm really sorry. Because a skinny pani had that ceremony, that morning morning uh, sacrifice. And their best sacrifice, they were the only Indian people, the only people in North America that had a living sacrifice. And their best sacrifice was a Lakota maiden. So those skiddy pani would grade our villages for our young women. That's why we hated them. My goodness, that, my, my goodness, that, that was just awful. But that's not written in the book. That's not written in the book. We have an oral history. Indian people have an oral history. And that was told to me. And that's something that has stayed with me. And I will tease these honey people, these skinny honey every now and then, you know, about how terrible they used to be. Until, who was it, Chief 
federal chair stopped it, right? The uh, bands of the Dakota are basically related, but not really. But we are basically related, and we tend to stay among the different bands. We know who we are related to. When I was growing, my grandma would take me in Rosebud to meet my relatives. Oh my goodness. We would go to all these different places, all these different houses, and she would say, this is your aunt so-and-so, this is your uncle so-and-so, this is your cousin so-and-so, this is your grandpa. I was related to everybody. <laughs> everybody. And so, Many years later, I married a Navajo man because I knew I wasn't related to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my children are half Navajo. <laughs> but women are, the Lakota women, are responsible for an awful lot of learning that happens. We teach, we are continually we teaching are young. I teach my language, the Lakota language in Lincoln. I had retired from teaching, and this young man was trying to earn something or other. And he was looking for a teacher of Lakota. He was not finding anybody in Lincoln who was willing to teach Lakota. And he kept coming back to me, kept coming back to me, and I would just tell him, no, 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 I'm not even fluent, well. And finally, this last time, he's coming, smiling at me, and I said, okay, Leo, okay, I'm a teacher. I will teach your class. Remember, I am not fluent, but I can teach, I can teach anything, really. So I just started teaching Lakota. And it's just been tremendous for a lot of people in Lincoln. Been really, really gratifying for me and for my family, for my granddaughter. One young man was so excited about taking my class. He was so excited because his mom, his grandma, was Indian. And he was just so excited about taking my class. And he even had his, his school, Southwest, accept my language class as part of his, one of his languages in his school. Excuse me, so he took my class for credit. And always in my class, I have the kids do a winner count. That the people that take my class, they need to do a winner count. For every year of their age, they need to note something that they remember. You start out with your birth. Say 1979 was the year of your birth. 1980, you learned how to walk. 1981, on and on and on. And so Joe did that. Joe Morrison. His grandparents lived in Vietnam. Paul. And Joe did that. And then I had them do a, um, a genealogy um, resume type thing. So you put yourself at the center and find out who your relatives are. Because you are related to a lot of people. Not just your mom and dad and grandparents on both sides and your aunts and uncles. You have lots of cousins and you have lots of aunts and uncles. Pretend, when you're finding these things out, pretend that you are living in a teal spy, in a family. So Joe did research. He found out that his grandma, Bev Juan, from White River on my reservation, is one of my cousins. <laughs> He was just so absolutely thrilled, you know, that he was related to me. He just thought that was really great. And I said, see, you wouldn't have found that out if I hadn't told you to 
do that research on yourself. So it's just another kind of teaching that women do. I don't, I don't um, compare myself to the way men teach. I don't do that. I just know that my way is better. No. <laughs> No, I just think that because women are teachers, women are nurturers, that we have a a um, a way that goes inside of somebody and makes them want to learn more about themselves. A lot of these items that I have here. Um, Go back to. Um, no, they don't. I was thinking they go back to the the warrior way of living. But they're, they're what women do. Even this. Oh, I could have gone down to the hardware store and bought an all to punch leather and then do your uh, sewing on leather, punch a hole, and then sew some more. I could have gone down and gotten an all. But I did what they did a long time ago. I just got an antler and sharpened it and made an all. Indian people were very creative, very imaginative people, and we made things from what was there. We didn't have a store to go to. We couldn't go and order something online. We had to make whatever it was that we wanted to wear or use. A friend of mine one time gave me this purse. It's a purse. I don't use it as a purse because, oh my goodness, everybody's staring at my purse, wanting to know about my purse, you know. But this is a purse, and it was a turtle shell, and it was it's lined with rabbit, and it has a fox head to close it. Just is really, really neat. A friend of mine, many years ago, I was a muzzleloader in one of my lives. I was a muzzleloader, and I have a muzzleloading rifle. And in a muzzleloading rifle, you need to have powder, black powder. And so Dick found this little turtle and made it into a powder horn for me. Put a measure on it and I just pour my black powder into my rifle with this. Just the way the Indian people would have done a long time ago. Oh, I could use that for this. Really great. They used to let me take my rifle into places where I did a presentation. Ah, you would have let me, huh, Roger? You would have let yes. me bring my rifle. Yeah, should have done that. But I don't do that anymore. I just bring the cover to my muzzleloading rifle. And Ed made this for me. Ed beaded this. Like I said, he was a very imaginative person. And he put the sign of a turtle on here. My rifle has a sign of a turtle on it also. Now, among my people, Iron shell is just another word for a turtle. And iron shell means long life. And I decided a long time ago, I was going to live a long time. So I have this huge collection of turtles. Well, it's not a huge collection anymore. You know, I had like 500, 600 kinds of turtles. I'm down to maybe 50 or 60 turtles anymore, but I've moved a lot. And I've left turtles in different places. But uh, they have helped me live a long time. And they will continue to help me live even longer. <clears throat> One time when we were living on the reservation, there was a, uh, a quill work workshop. I don't know how to do a quill work. I'd never really been taught to do covert. So I thought I wanted to go. And my granddaughter, just a little girl, and she went with me everywhere. So she and I went to this workshop, and 
the instructors telling us how to do things, how a long time ago the uh, people, the Indian women, would get the quills from the porcupine, and we didn't need to kill that porcupine like they do anymore. We didn't need to kill him. All we did was take a piece of cloth and throw it on top of that silly porcupine. It doesn't move very fast. <laughs> throw it on top of that porcupine, and when you take the covering away, you get all these quills <laughs> stuck in that, you know? So we have all these quills. And then we let the silly guy, you know, go away to where he was going. And then we would take them and we would color them with plants, with different roots, with different things from creek beds, you know, that we saw was pretty in there. We would somehow get some dye from that and we would dye our quills and make the wonderful colors that we had. Anymore, we just use red dye. That works the best. But I didn't know how to quill. And she was telling us that a long time ago, the women would take these quill and they would keep them in their mouth and keep them moist. And then pull them over their teeth and make them flat. And then when they were flat, then you wrap them around a piece of leather or a piece of cardboard or whatever you wanted to use. And now people think it's yucky to hold a quill in their mouth, you know, or they're not careful and that quill will stick their tongue. But anyway, they don't keep them in their mouths anymore. So she was spraying quills. And my granddaughter was working on something and she had a little spray bottle and she was going around to the tables and she was spraying and she would be wrapping and spraying. And here's these grown women sitting at these tables, you know, just, just working so intensely, very intently making what we were making. My granddaughter's wandering around. This is a piece my granddaughter made. Wonderful, beautiful, exactly what the instructor said. This is the piece that I made. I was being very careful, sitting there being very careful. And you can tell how very amateurish this is and how really great this one <laughs> is that my granddaughter made. And so one of the old women there said, made the comment, well, you know, she probably did quill work in her other life. <laughs> and I said, hmm, probably, probably. Uh, we are very spiritual people. I am a very spiritual person. Like I said, I'm a recovering Catholic, but I'm a very <laughs> spiritual person. Many years ago, I was getting ready to go to Mass, and I had this epiphany. Something is saying, what is wrong with you, Phyllis? Here you are in the middle of your spirituality, and you're going to Mass, you're going to Catholic Mass. That changed my mind. That made me take advantage of our Lakota spirituality. It's something that we can't do all the time, the rituals that we have. We cannot do them all the time. The epitome. The best thing that we have is done once a year, our sun dance. That is done once a year out in the open. And it's a very grueling ceremony. And the men only used to do that ceremony, they used to do that sun dance. But, you know, after many years, the government got very afraid of the Indian men. And they wouldn't allow the Indian men to do an awful lot of things. They were forever putting them in jail, imprisoning them. And so the women picked up. <coughs> they did. They become the breadwinners. They did what the men did. And with those ceremonies that the white buffalo calf woman brought to the Lakota people, she brought them to the men. Because she saw how the men were falling away from doing good. She brought them to the men. And 
<coughs> government decided that they were afraid of the Indian men and were doing what the women, the, the women started doing what the men were, were had previously done. Some of our ceremonies were geared still just to the men, and they were done uh, undercover. They were done underground, and the men primarily did them until the women started to reassert themselves and say, I can do that. I can handle that. And that's when we started sun dancing. And that's when we started going to the Nikis, to the sweat lodges. That's when we started doing the ceremonies that the white buffalo cattlemen brought to the men. When I was doing my humbleches, the crying for a vision, I was told by an elder woman who was really a very good friend of mine, Ali Mepeshni. She was a really good friend of mine. And she would just shake her head. When she saw that I was getting ready to go on the hill to do my humbleche, she, was, she would say, you know, women don't have to do that. Women have <coughs> always known our path in life. We have always known what we have to do in life. It's the men that can't make up their mind. <laughs> so they have to go up on a hill and they have to pray to Chinkashua and they have to ask specifically for themselves, what am I supposed to do? You know, how am I supposed to do this? And on and on and on. Women have always known. So you don't have to go up there and pray the way the men do. If you're going to insist on doing that, just go for one day and don't go overnight. So that's what I would do. And she used to say, yeah, I, you could go out on the hill in my backyard. Just go up on that little rise there. That's all you'd have to do. Just, just pray like you ordinarily pray. And in the sweat lodges, that was for the men to purify themselves help them think better. The women have always purified themselves. Every month we purified ourselves. The women, the men did not. But the women take advantage of the Inibis now. Sometimes there will be more women at an Inibi than men. Because the men still can't find their way there. They just say, you know, cut them up and give us parts of him and say, you will use it for this and you'll use it for that. Tunkashua gave us brains. He gave us an imagination. And he gave us the buffalo. And we learned how to do things from that buffalo. We learned to pray. If we had to uh, kill a buffalo or any animal, we would first put down some tobacco. We would first give a prayer to Tunkashua and to the, the animal and thanking them for giving them, giving their life for us, for us. The women have um, kept on with that. We have kept on making things and learning from just everyday things. One thing that has, was passed on to the uh, men especially was our pipe. Now this is just a piece of ash, just an ash branch. This is just a piece of pipe song, pipe song. There's a treaty, the only treaty that we have left, and the government made over 500 treaties for the Indian people. And they proceeded to break all of them, but we have one left the Paisong Treaty. And that says that any Indian person can go to Pipestone, Minnesota, and we can dig the stone. We can take as much of the stone as we want, and we don't have to pay anybody for it. So hey, I took advantage of that treaty. And Ed and I drove to Pipestone, Minnesota. And I signed up for, Ed is not Indian, like I said. I signed up for a mine. I'd never done that before. Not ever had I done that. My goodness. <laughs> and here I am 
beforehand going and making sure that I have a sledgehammer, that I have a wedge. Huh, do you remember me, Jeanette, going and making sure I had all this stuff? All these tools. And we drove to Python, Minnesota, and Ed could not come with me, show me how to use those tools, help me find what I needed to find. Just my kids and I, we went down into my mine, and I proceeded to work at getting the stone out. And there weren't any other women, not ever <coughs> had there been a woman <coughs> sign up for a mine. I'm the only woman that ever signed up for a mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I got out lots of stone, and I would lug it, carry it over to the van, and put it in the van, and tell Ed there. And I'd give it to Ed. Because Ed made these beautiful pipes. Ed took the stone that I gave him, and he made these wonderful peace pipes. I would go with him, and we would cut ash branches. We used ash, because that's what they used a long time ago. Anymore, in pipes on Minnesota, I've gone to the different vendors, and I have seen their stems, and they are any kind of wood, and they will glue them together, cut it, glue them together, use a vise and, and press them together. But I have this problem. I'm thinking, that's a pipe. And when you light this, after you put tobacco in there and you light it, and you're smoking it, all that warmth is going to come through here. And it's going to make that glue melt after a while. So I didn't want to do that. And Ed said, it's really hard to put a hole through the ash. I said, but they did a long time ago. We can do it they did a long time ago. So we did it. And Ed was a big man. And he wanted a big pipe. So we had to have this big stem for him. Mine, mine is just a little pipe. Just a nice little pipe. And sometimes with these big pipes, we would be pushing, pushing, pushing a, a hanger through here, through that, it's got a soft center. And all you do is push on that soft center and the other, it'll come out on the other side. But sometimes it would come out in the center, you know, and just veer and go out that way. So we would have to start all over again. It, again, takes a little bit of patience to make these pipes, but they're very worthwhile. And Ed put silver, primarily, on his pipes for decoration. But I was remembering a long time ago when the invaders came, they came west and they had their little towns, like Danabra, a little town. And always they had a newspaper. They had printing presses. And they had lead in those printing presses, right? So I wanted what they did a long time ago. The Indian people would steal. They had no idea that they were stealing. They were just using it. They would take this lead and they would make decoration. And that's what I wanted them to do, to put the lead on pipes like they did a long time ago. The women did beadwork. There are some men now who do beadwork, but primarily the women did beadwork. We did beautiful beadwork. One time, I was beating a belt, not this particular belt, another belt, on a loom that Ed had made for me. And you know how when you have kids, the best time to do your work is like one, two o'clock in the morning, and you're tired, and I was tired, and I'm doing my bead work, you know, my loom work. There was a lot of yellow and white in that. Uh, next morning, I had to tear out all the bead work that I'd done, <laughs> because I mixed up my yellow and white. But, Indian, people, Indian women always did deeper. One time a friend of mine, well, several friends of mine, we were at a conference someplace. We were talking about moving camp. 
and uh, somebody made the comment, you know, a lot of tribes, oh dear, I forgot I had all this stuff on. <laughs> uh, a lot of tribes made different things, like the, um, the Pawnee made uh, pottery, and uh, especially the Apache, they made baskets. And they used the baskets when they were moving camp. And the Lakota, what did you guys have? And I said, well, we had par flesh. We made containers out of par flesh. They said, you did? And I said, yeah. We used par flesh not just for the caches of food that we put away, but we made them in whatever size container that we wanted. And then we put our own colors on there and our own decorations so that they would belong, you knew that that belonged to that person. Just like our beaver, they knew that that belonged to that person because it was that color or that computer symbol was on there. And that's what we did with our, our flesh bags. I have a, my Lexi Albert white hat, my uncle Albert, has a, a war bonnet, a headdress. And he has it all wrapped together so that the feathers are all standing up. And he has it put in a parflesh container just for that. My friend Lydia is an author, a poet, and sits on many boards across the United States. And she was always going someplace. And she had her laptop. And so I had a friend of mine make her a briefcase from Parflesh. Only person not traveling on any airlines that carried that Parflesh briefcase, you can bet. <laughs> any of the books over there that I have out, you're welcome to look at when we go over there. <coughs> you will see some things in books what I'm talking about. Most of the time, what I am talking about has come down to me from my elders. Because like I said, we have an oral history. And I did research among my Lakota people. I listened to them. And I wrote down what they said. Sometimes I did research in libraries most of the time, that research wasn't as comprehensive as what the people were telling us. When I was at Sente, in some of our classes, we would have to go and, and um, do research with, their, with elders that lived out different places. And they didn't like the students coming to them with their recording devices, with their pens and their paper. They, they didn't like that. So sometimes they wouldn't say anything. They, or they'd say very little. So we got really used to going and talking to people and just listening. And then driving like crazy back to the university so we could write things down. <laughs> I used to have a, a bone knife, a big bone knife. And I had it on my tool belt. I had it in the back. But I forgot one time, and I didn't take it off before I sat down in my car. And I sat on my bone knife and broke it. Mm -hmm. And that was passed on from a long time ago. I feel so bad about it. But I had that big bone knife so that I could tell people, Indian women always had a big knife. We always had a big knife because we did almost all the work in the village. And there was always some use for that knife. One day, again, Ed came in and gave me this knife. I said, how pretty. And he said, well, just in case you do some work sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but he made me a nice pretty little knife from an antler and from his hacksaw blade. And underneath everything that I've got here, I've got this beautiful star quote. Indian women make these star quilts. I learned how from Ollie. And I could 
never get the center right. Oh my goodness, it just takes me hours to get the center right. But Indian women always bothered to make a star quote so that we could give this to somebody. Not for ourselves, so that we could give it to somebody. Lakota people are known primarily for their generosity and how we tend to give things away. When the government came and was going to take care of us, they built halls in the different, on the different reservations. And it was primarily for their meetings that they wanted those halls. And Indian people would have giveaways in there. We would have our powwows in there. We would have our dances during the winter. And we would have our giveaways and give things away. And the government got so upset at us. Ah, you people, you don't have anything, and yet you're always making things and giving them away. So they took their buildings back. <laughs> we don't even have those anymore. But I want to thank you so much for sitting and listening to me. And if you have any questions, I don't want Roger to throw himself in front of me or anything right here. <laughs> I'll just tell you that we need to go over to his Pawnee Art Center. And I will definitely answer any kind of questions that you might have. And if I can't answer those questions, Carla, who listens to me all the time, will answer you. <laughs> thank you so much.